Hey, this week, um, I went and got my oil changed on, well, my, my car's oil changed on Monday, and um, I, I get there, the guy's pulling me in, you know, you know, the, you know the deal, and, and uh, I'm getting out of the car, and he says, hey, you think we're living in the end times? And I was, I was like, wait, what, what? And he, and he goes, like, I mean, I'm really, I'm thinking, this is like, say, pastor on my head, or what, is what? Like, do I know you, you know, kind of thing. Uh, but then he, then he goes, I know it's kind of a weird question, but, but, but I think, I think so. What do you think? And I said, well, uh, I think we're one day closer today than we were yesterday. And I know that Jesus even said, only the father knows. I don't think anybody knows. Uh, but I know this, I've read, you know, I've read the end and if we're with him, if we're in Christ, then we win. We're good. And then he goes, yeah, but don't you think like things are escalating? And I was like, well, you know, my, I mean, yes, initially, my quick answer is yes. But I said, but we only live here in this era, this period of time. We've never lived, I mean, like civil war. I bet they thought things are escalating, y'all. Um, World War II, I mean, you think about it, right? But the scripture does say, and I, I said, the scripture does say that things will escalate. Yeah, before... Christ returns, my theology says he could come any moment. And he goes, yeah, but it's, I mean, it's getting crazy out here. And I said, all right, hey, um, I think Haveline probably would be good. I mean, that's like, yeah, I don't know. What do you, um, but that was about it. I mean, he got back to work and then I chatted with him briefly, but um, this brother was like, he, he started getting me a little stressed. Like, I don't, like, things are escalating, you know. Um, this brother was under a lot of pressure, right? And um, so then I'm in several meetings um, this week, and one was a group of leaders, and we started talking about this. Not, not that, but this, that, man, it is, it's getting crazier and crazier to be a follower of Jesus in, in our culture in these days. Anybody feeling it? Are you feeling the pressure? Like things are, are really are shifting, uh, and yet, again, that's not anything new. In fact, uh, we talk about this often here that, um, you know, the, the, the secular age that we find ourselves in, many people do, many, many believers do, do say that, you know, civil, that really modern Western civilization is unraveling in a lot of ways. Um, and here we are on the two, what, 247th birthday of our country. And, you know, some, a lot of us are concerned, like, where is this heading? Because we live in a culture where we've, again, we put truth on the shelf, you know, that, that makes for a real unstable culture. When you can't define what a woman is, you know, I'm like, what, what world am I living in right now? you right. It's like anything goes. And yet the Bible says that's exactly, that's exactly who we are and really have always been. And I was talking to this group of leaders and I was saying that, you know what, this image of, of exiles in Babylon is, is the, you know, the trajectory of, of the Christian life in here in America. In fact, that's what the book of Re uh, Revelation is all about. Um, Scott McKnight, in his new book on Revelation, he calls us dissident disciples, opposing nonconformist disciples, meaning that we live in a different kingdom. We live in a different way. And when people see us, we, we're a little weird. And y'all, it's getting weird out there. And yet I would argue that the darker it gets, the brighter we shine. There is a, a, a theologian by the name of Stanley Hauerwas. Um, well, he's, he, I, think he's, I think he's at Duke, University, Duke uh, Divinity now. But he wrote a book, I think 25 years ago or so, called Resident Aliens. Um, Life in the Christian Colony. And, and what he describes is exactly that, that we are resident aliens from another country, from another world, living here on earth, and the church becomes this Christian colony of believers. Not, not that we you know, are, are sent away from the world. Jesus says, no, you're in the world. We often say you're in the world, but not of the world. But G what he was saying was you're sent into the world. You're not of the world. You are, you're weird. You're different you're set apart, you're holy, but you're sent into the world to live a life that points everyone to Jesus. And, and so Hauerwas says it this way. He says that now the, the common view is that there is no story 
except for the story that you chose when you had no story. You don't, you're not born into a story or a narrative or a world that makes any kind of sense or has purpose. You make up your story along the way and live that out, right? You see this? And yet the Bible says, no, 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 no. The Christian life is that we have stepped into a story and that we are actually being formed by a reality, God, and we don't get to choose him or what he's like or who he is. He has created us and he sends us into the world. Now you're like, Jeff, why are you telling us all this? Wouldn't it be amazing if in these crazy times, wouldn't it be wild if we had like a book? <laughs> wouldn't it be great if we had like somebody who's been before us who could go, I'll tell you exactly how to live this life. Jesus, okay, is the one. But this is what the book of Hebrews is all about. It's written to a group of, of Christians living in a Christian colony, okay, and even more so than us, a small group of formerly Jews, Hebrews, who are now Christians living in cultural, um, I mean, a global city context, uh, likely Rome. And the whole book is, don't give up. Yes, things are crazy out there, but don't give up. Keep on focusing on Jesus because Jesus is better than anything else you're going to go after. Any other story you want to find yourself in or make up to dive into, the story of Jesus and what he's accomplished for you is the great story. So let's go. So I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews, all right? Because this is exactly why this book was written. It's to encourage believers like us but I just want to just encourage you today as we do every week. But are you feeling it? I want you to think about your own life in, in your, your workplace. I was talking to, again, a group of leaders saying, man, I mean, in my work, I'm just, I'm telling you, I am like, it's, I'm like the only, you know, I'm, I'm the only believer. Or I'm the only, I feel like everything is getting more pressurized. It's getting straight up weird to live as a devoted follower of Jesus out in the world. And I could probably argue that if you're, not, if you're not feeling a little weird, you know, how, how contrasting is your life really? Are you living as a nonconformist, kind of opposing, dissentant, you know, disciple in, in the world? Because our weirdness, how about that? This, the fact that we are separate is what points people to God. It's what points people to him. So we don't lose that. We're not talking about being jerks. We're talking about being loving, light, salt in the world. But many of us feel under pressure. And I wonder uh, if you feel that today. Where do you find relief? Where do you find comfort? And I want to encourage today, Jesus is better. And it's in Hebrews chapter 4. Go ahead and turn. There. You're going to need your Bible open, by the way, um, throughout. So uh, Hebrews 4, we're going to go 14 through 5. There's, a, there's an unfortunate uh, chapter break. Uh, and we're going to keep pressing on with the train of thought. Jesus is a better comfort because he knows some things. He knows the power of temptation. Jesus is a better comforter because he knows the problem of weakness. And he's a better comforter because he knows the price of obedience. So first of all, he knows the power of temptation. He understands the power, the problem, and the, the price. That's where we're heading. All right, so look at this, verse 14. Here we go. Since then, he's drawing back on everything that he said thus far in last week in chapter 4, 3, 3 and 4. Since then, we have a great high priest... Who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace in help or to help in time of need. All right, so since then, since then, the writer is gonna take us now into the third section of this book, and it goes all the way to Hebrews 10, 18, where he's gonna argue that Jesus is, is the better, a better priest, a better high priest. He's the better priesthood. Now, I'm guessing you came to church this morning and you weren't thinking, I wonder if Jesus is a high, greater high priest. 
I wonder, like that, that was probably not what you were thinking about. But with these Hebrews, they would have thought about this. They would have connected immediately. Like, wait, wait, what? Yes. Tell us more about this. Because the high priest was their connection with God, right? It, 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 you know, we, they were the, you know, the priests were the ones from the tribe of Levite. Okay, that'd be from a certain tribe. Again, we have to do this throughout Hebrews. It's a hard book to preach because you've got to go, okay, yo, here's what they already know that we don't know. All right, so they're listening. He's the better high priest. But, it, but because the high priest was from the tribe of Levi, okay? He's from an Aaronic line, okay? We've been reading about Moses and Aaron in our readings every day. And, and he, he uh, would pass through a curtain, you probably know that, into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. There'd be an altar, there, the Ark of the Covenant was in there. He would go through all of these rituals to be holy, set apart before he could ever go in. And he would make offerings you know, on behalf of the people. And the priests then would do this in, this, in, the, in the sanctuary all year long, making sacrifices for the people. He was their connection to God. This is a big deal. And yet what he's saying is Jesus didn't go through a curtain. He came through the heavens is what he's saying. He didn't go to an altar before God. He's on the throne of God in heaven. He doesn't come from the ironic line of priest. He's from, we'll learn, from a much older uh, order of priesthood. He's a pure higher priest. He doesn't sacrifice for him for himself as the priest had to do as well. He becomes the sacrifice. He is the pure one who doesn't need to sacrifice for himself. So th these are the kinds of things going through their minds. Uh, but he says that Jesus is like the priest in one very significant way. That's why I've shared all this to this point. He was tempted to sin like us in every respect, it says in the ESV, in every way. Now, this begs the question for me immediately. Could Jesus have sinned? And if he, if he couldn't sin, then was it temptation? Right? And if he could... I thought about this this, this week... Wait, if he could, then could he still? That's unstable. Like, okay, that's... So let's think about this for a moment. This is important to understand. We don't have time to dive into the theological debate that is peccability versus impeccability. Okay? Latin, Latin terms. Impeccability means no sin. Like, he could not have sinned. Think about this. Now, both sides of the, of the debate would say he did not sin. Right? Or he's not, sorry, he's not the Jesus of the Bible. He did not sin. And we know this is very clear. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him who knew no sin. 1 Peter 2, chapter 22 says he did not sin, nor did any sinful thing come out of his mouth. And so it's obvious when you look at the life of Jesus. And, and keep tracking with me. If he's God in the flesh, God has nothing to do with sin. God has never sinned. So I guess you could pose the question, well, wait, so when he became the God man, did somehow something, now he could sin. James chapter 119 says that God can't be tempted. And yet Jesus was tempted from the very start of his ministry. He was tempted, right? And a lot of us look at even that story where we see his temptation in the wilderness and we think, well, there's a big throwdown up against Satan. He won, bam, game over. And he kicks into his ministry, never to be tempted again. He was tempted throughout his entire life, yet without sin. Now, I'm gonna lean, I'm gonna fall on the side of, he's impeccable. He was and is impeccable. He did not sin and he could not have sinned. And again, begs the question, but wait. So if he was not, or was that really temptation then? And how can he sympathize with us if he could not have sinned? Now, there's a lot more you can dive into all that if you want to geek out with me a little bit. Um, but there are a few ways to explain this. All right. And I'll start with the idea that you don't have to know. No, you have to experience something to know about it. Right? Think about that. God knows everything in the world, uh, yet without sin. 
Like you don't have to do something in order to know about it. But Jesus' sympathy goes way beyond that. In fact, his sympathy and understanding of temptation goes beyond our understanding. You say, well, well, how is that the case? Let me explain. John Owen, who was an English minister, uh, a theologian at Oxford in, 16, in the 1600s, 1658, he wrote a book that we've referenced from this uh, stage before, um, The Mortification of Sin. And he also wrote a book, check this out, Temptation, The Nature and Power of It, The Danger of Entering Into It, and the means of preventing that danger with resolution of sundry cases thereunto belonging. That's a book, yo. Um, that, and so he was one of these. Uh, among, he was a separatist. But he was among others who were, who were like, okay, let's get really underneath this. And I think we've lost this in our culture, Christian culture. He, he, would, he would argue, if you're not fighting against sin, you're, you're, you're sinning. And so a question I would ask you right here up front, what temptations are you wrestling with in these days? What sins are you fighting against right now in your life? And I want you to think about that. If you can't answer that quickly, I wonder if you're fighting. I wonder if you're really in the battle because he, he defines temptation this way. And you know that temptation is not sin. We can talk about that a little bit today. Um, but he says, it's anything that entices your mind or heart away from obedience to God and redirects it towards sin. Now, most of us would have gone, yeah, I probably would have come up with something like that, right? But temptation in itself is not sin. We're all tempted. Jesus was tempted, yet without sin. But what does it mean that he was tempted like us in every respect? Because really, again, like he was never tempted to commit tax fraud. So not, not in every, he was never tempted to, to speed or to look at porn or, or to do, you know, a research paper with chat GPT. Jesus was not tempted in every way like us, right? So what does that mean? It means that he does and he even goes beyond the understanding of what it is to be tempted. You see, he, think about it this way. Here's, here's, this is helpful. And Owen jumps into this a bit. It's like pressure. Think of temptation as pressure. Pressure, because that's what it is, pressure to do something. Um, and some of us are pressured to do things that others of us are not. Like you wrestle with certain sins that maybe I don't. I wrestle with certain sins that you don't. So you could feel a lot of pressure or a lot of pressure could come your way and you're like, nah, I ain't, ain't going to do that. No, I'm not. That's not a pressure for me. And yet Jesus, the Bible will teach us that Jesus felt and, and experienced more pressure than any of us. I thought about this, an analogy that helped me understand it is pressure builds um, when you go into the ocean and, and go down deeper and deeper. Now, we've seen this recently in the Titan submersible, uh, submersible that, you know, the tragic loss of those lives in that little submarine. Um, but I, I so <laughs> Google this, you can go thousand feet into the water before you can't breathe at all. I mean, like with the, with the scuba gear on. You can't, you, you can't, you have pressure on your body. You can't, you can't take any breath. In fact, you go much further than that. It'll crush your rib cage. Like the pressure is so strong. They were at a two and a half miles below the ocean, 400 times atmospheric pressure because of a design flaw in the sub. I read that they, they didn't even know what happened. Like instantaneously, the pressure is so intense, bam, they're gone. And that's how they tracked it, because they, they heard it. And they would have never known what was happening. My point is this. Jesus went deeper and further into temptation. Satan himself coming after him over and over again to the point where Jesus experienced more pressure to sin than any of us, and yet without sin. C.S. Lewis offers this. He, in, in this is a little longer than something I might normally quote, but this really helped me a lot. I'm spending a lot of time on this first, on this first, first point. C.S. Lewis describes it like this. No man knows how bad he is until he has tried very hard to be good. A silly idea is current that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. You following him? 
After all, you find out the strength of the German army by fighting against it, not by giving in. You find out the strength of the wind by trying to walk against it, not by lying down. A man who gives into temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would be like an hour later. That is why bad people in one sense know very little about badness. They have lived a sheltered life by always giving in. We never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside us until we try to fight it. And Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is also the only man who knows the full what temptation really means. The only complete realist. Wow. That reminded me, I used to talk to, when I was talking to Travis, my son growing up, um, when we were talking about temptation, I remember telling him uh, that, hey, Travis, never forget, never forget the good guys fight. The good guys fight. Meaning the bad guys, they just give up. They're not in the fight. So we sin and we will fail, yes, but don't ever stop fighting. The good guys fight. And I want to ask you, are you fighting the good fight these days? And again, I want you to think about what sins you wrestle with. And often we think of sins that we commit. You know, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm drinking too much. Maybe the case. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with, with porn. Or I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, gosh, I'm really being tempted. I'm in this relationship and it's not, I know it's not holy. It's not godly. Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's pride. Maybe you have a judgmental spirit. I mean, it could be all kinds of things. Maybe it's laziness spiritually. What sin are you fighting? Or how about this? What sin have you just given into? And you're being reminded by the spirit this morning. That no, that needs to end in your life. Be, not simply so you'll become more like Jesus. Yes, but because that's where the life is. That's where the joy is found, Right? And so Jesus has gone deeper and further than any of us. He knows the power of temptation and he sympathizes. He feels it. It's like um, I have a friend who's um, an ultra marathon runner. So I know what it is to run a little bit, right? I don't know what it's like to run 100 miles. I don't know what it's like to run 150 miles. He does. Only he knows. I don't know. See, and that's the point. Jesus has been there. He understands you fully. Like he gets us. Like he really gets us. And he gets you. He understands. And so what I'm trying to tell you is this. What does it say to do then? It says, draw near. Draw near. Confidently draw near. Because here's what many of us do. We enter in temptation and we see it as opportunity for sin. We're like, "Uh uh-oh, I'm being tempted. Next step, bam, sin. No, temptation next step obedience every time you're tempted to sin and it'll happen all day long in more ways than you even know and this week more than you even know you have an opportunity to obey him not given to sin every point of temptation is an opportunity for growth to become more like jesus are you in the fight but here's what some of you need to hear today Sometimes we'll be tempted, and I'm like, man, I can't even believe I'm even thinking that. Like, I, wow, I can't believe I'm like even thinking about doing this thing. Or, wow, I am messed up. And yes, your pastor's messed up. I mean, if y'all knew what I was thinking, we all are messed up. But here's my point. Sometimes we even enter into temptation, and we think, Mm, wow, God, I'm so sorry. That's jacked up. Like I can't even, I'm, there's so much sin inside of me. But you need to hear this. It's our weakness. It's even our temptation towards sin that actually triggers his love for us. So that you might find grace and mercy in a time of need. Don't miss this. When you find yourself in the pressure, under pressure, to give into sin, that, how about this? That same sin that you committed yesterday, now you're tempted. Watch this. God is running to you. Jesus is coming to you. The Spirit is giving you power to say, no, 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 come, come, come. Come to me. You're not, you're not, I'm not offended by you. I know you're a sinner. His love, in fact, is triggered towards us in our temptation to bring strength and the help that we need and to bring comfort that, Lord, you're better. Jesus, you're better. 
He knows the power of temptation and he sympathizes with you. Check this out. Secondly, he knows the problem of weakness. Look at verse five. Again, we have an unfortunate chapter break here because the same train of thought. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And not one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ, so also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so he's noting, I think you're tracking with him here. Every high priest had to offer sacrifice for his own sin. He was beset with the same weakness, the same sins as everybody else. Okay, but he's, he's making the point now. He's, and, 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 well, think about this before I say all that. He, this, is a, this makes for a very unstable priesthood, right? <laughs> the guy going in for you is a sinner. He's no better than you. Now, we tend to often think that, you know, pastors or priests or others can't quite relate, like they're living in a different world. You know this is not the case. This is not the case, and nor was it for the high priest. This is the point he's making. He says that every high priest comes from this Aaronic, you know, lineage, okay? Jesus doesn't come from that line at all, as we'll see. But we, we know this, that the priesthood became like any other organization, any nation, on our country's birthday, any, any group or organization, your, your workplace, friendship, any family can become corrupt and unstable along the way, right? Because of sin. And he's saying what we, what we know in, his, in history as well is that the priesthood was very unstable. I mean, it, it became, it was on a spiral out of control. In fact, we know that in the Old Testament, uh, high priests were, I mean, they all involved in all kinds of stuff. Some of you know, maybe Eli, the story of Eli and his, and his two sons. He had Phineas and, Phineas and Ferb um, as sons. And sorry, uh, Hophni? Hophni was the other son, not Ferb. Uh, Hophni was the other one. But Phineas and Hophni were his sons. And they were totally jacked up. You can read about it. Um, they're high priests. And they were, I mean, just horrible and sinful people. And, and you may not know that Herod the Great, this became a politically selected thing. We see this confluence of politics and religion, and we all know where that goes. And, and so Herod uh, appointed no less than six high priests himself. And those guys were playing to his power. And we see there the dangerous outcome, right, of this confluence, this syncretism of Religion and the state, okay? Babylon and what we see now today, the kingdom of God. Unstable and corrupt, completely. Whenever, and whenever the church steps into that world, power corrupts, yes, and corrupts completely. But he also says that, that Jesus is this high priest forever. He's not from the Aaronic priesthood. And we're gonna get to that um, in Hebrews 7. We're gonna learn more about this. But in, in, again, sorry, but they would have exactly, known exactly what he's talking about. Melchizedek, what? What's up with Melchizedek? He's this real mysterious king priest that Abraham actually runs into long before the priesthood was established in Genesis 14. And he's in Salem, which is, by the way, previous, later, Jerusalem, where the temple actually is gonna come. So he becomes this, this mysterious high priest and he offers this blessing to, to, uh, to him, to, to Abraham, and he gives him 10%, which is where the, the gift comes from later on to the, to the priesthood. But um, he's this mysterious priesthood. The point is this, that he's not from an Aaronic priesthood. He's not from an unstable, corrupt priesthood. He's from this forever eternal priesthood. He, he precedes Aaron's priesthood and he supersedes every other priest that comes along the way. That's what he's trying to say to us here, right? So the writer is saying, Jesus is from an eternal order. You see how he's just separating Jesus from all things. No beginning, no end. He's sinless. And yet watch this. He's, he's approachable is what he wants us to see. 
His, his posture is not one of pointing fingers at you when you sin or when you mess up. His posture is one of open arms because he doesn't have to offer sacrifice for you. He's already done so. And so he just comes to us and says, embrace my grace. But how can this be? How can even this be? Think about it. Even Jesus experienced the corruption of the priesthood. He was a victim of it. You might remember in the Easter story, it's the high priest who are driving the entire thing to get him executed. Jesus becomes then the high priest who would become the sacrifice himself, the great high priest. He completely understands. And not only does he understand, he died to fix it. All of the unstable stuff in your life, Jesus is your better comfort. Maybe you feel that you're a victim of others' instability or corruption. Maybe your whole life is the result of your own corruption and instability. Either way, Jesus says, come to me. I am your better comfort. He, own, he knows our weaknesses. In fact, when he, you know, when, what, what he's telling us here is when your weaknesses rise up, when temptations come, he's saying you can turn to him because he knows fully what you're going through and he's not repelled by it. In fact, he steps into it and says, I know exactly what you're feeling. And the empathy, the sympathy and empathy that he has, he says, come to me. Friends, are you coming to him these days? Are you drawing near to him? Because he knows the power of temptation in your life. He really does. And he understands. He knows the problem of weakness, having lived this life. And he knows now the price of obedience. I want us to land with this. And then we will partake of the Lord's Supper together. To say yes, 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 and remember. So just as Jesus experienced pressure of temptation more than anyone, he knows the price of obedience better than anyone, right? Now this one makes a little more sense perhaps. Look at verse seven. In the days of his flesh, Jesus, okay, so during his life, and again, his whole life, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Now, here, again, this is an experiential kind of learning. Jesus didn't have to learn. Uh, you know, I could, you could say, well, he had to learn obedience from his parents, and he did. Learn obedience, he, obedience to the law. He had to learn, he had to obey his thirst. He had to obey gravity. I mean, he, had, he learned obedience experientially, though. It's not like he... He didn't have to learn all of these things in the way that we would have to learn. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Again, an experiential kind of learning. He's the only one who has succeeded in the context of being human. Because none of us can and none of us have, but the embodied God in Christ has. He's lived the perfect life for us, felt all the pressure. He, 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 he cries out uh, in the garden. He cries out on the cross. He knows what it is to feel like God is nowhere around, like the Father has abandoned him. He knows exactly what it is to go into the deepest, darkest places of the soul. In fact, he's gone deeper and further under pressure into the darkness than you could ever imagine. You can trust him. He's that kind of a savior. And he knows the price of obedience because he offered himself a once and for all sacrifice. And this is where I'm going to catapult us to Hebrews 10, where he starts to wrap up this whole thought. We'll get there in some weeks to come. But verse 11 says this. You can see it on the screen. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Think about this. For hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the priest would make sacrifice for the people, and none of them could take away the sins of the people. And yet someone had to atone, or God would cease to be holy. He'd cease to be just. Somebody, something had to pay the price, right? This was a bloody religion. 
But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, come on. He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, somebody said amen. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Anybody here today being sanctified? Anybody? Praise be to God. He will finish what he has started in you. He will complete the work that he has begun. And so now for all time, Jesus has brought the sacrifice so that we can be completely forgiven. And then he says this in verse 18, where there is forgiveness of these, these sins, our sins, there's no longer any offering for sin. There's no longer an offering needed. Praise be to God. Amen? Amen. And so as we set our hearts on the Lord's Supper, I just ask you again, are you feeling the pressure? Are you feeling the pressure? And I would just ask you this, as our team comes out, I want to ask you this. What, what are you looking at? Where, where's your focus these days? I think you're here today probably because, um, probably because you, you're like, man, I just... I mean, for a lot of reasons, we come to church, love coming to church, but you probably want to be like, you want to be encouraged. You want to be comforted. Like, remind me again, because it's, it's tough out there. Remind me again of who I am in Christ. But I want to ask you, where is your focus these days? Because my brother that I, I, I met at the, you know, when I got my oil changed, uh, he was under, the, under pressure. And I couldn't help but think, man, if you're really focused on the craziness of this world, then that's where your mind's going to be. And yeah, it's crazy. And whatever we focus on is going to be, can I say it? It's going to be magnified. Wherever you bring your attention, that is going to be magnified. Is your focus on Christ Jesus and who he is and what he's done for you? If so, he is magnified in your life. We don't make him bigger, but he becomes bigger. And as he's magnified, then the problems in your life get smaller and smaller. And friends, you can't make it through this coming week, without simply you know, going to church and hoping this will hang with you. Yes, but you've got to remain in his word. You've got to continue to come back to him. But I want you to hear this today. Some of you are waiting to change before God will love you. Some of you are waiting for that temptation to go away, for that habitual sin to be done with. You're waiting on, maybe it's something, you're, you know, maybe it's anxiety and worry, all the things you're waiting on. When, that, when that's done and when I get my act together, God's really going to love me because then I'll be worthy. And friends, I'm, I'm here to tell you this morning, Christ has done everything that's necessary. And he is drawn to you in your sin. His heart is triggered toward you because of his mercy and his grace. He's not asking you to get your act together. Because check it out. You never will get it together. Our goal should always be to sin less. Though we'll never be sinless. But Jesus was. So we run to him. And so what I want us to do, we're going to enter into a song. I'm going to pray. We're going to set our hearts on him. Because Jesus says, uh, in fact, let's just close our eyes and bow our heads now. Jesus says in John 20, I've heard this before. Like, you know, you're in the Bible, right? You're in the Bible. And it's in John 20, 26. Jesus says, hey, you believe because you see me. Blessed are those who believe yet have not seen. And that's us today. Do you trust him? Friend, he is your better, better comfort. Turn to him. Let's set our hearts on him and worship him now. Lord, we thank you for the cross. Those of us in you are completely forgiven, totally loved. And we celebrate that now together. In your name we pray.